Okay, so here we are in the Chocolate Wars. Today we're going to look at chapters 17, 18, and maybe 19, depending on time. Um, and we want to remind ourselves that last time we saw Brother Leon and Cannoli. Um, and Brother Leon is manipulating Cannoli into selling the chocolates because Jerry is still saying no. And we know that right now Brother Leon is manipulating Cannoli's grade and Cannoli wants a better grade. He knows that a bad grade could be really devastating. So he wants a better grade and Brother Leon is going to try to convince him to sell the chocolates. What also happened was he convinced Cannoli to reveal the reason why Jerry had been saying no. Um, and now we know that when the 10 days are up, Jerry's supposed to start selling the chocolates again. Let's see what happens. All right, chapter 17. Adamal, three. Bouvet, five. The goober was impatient for the roll call to be over, or rather, for the roll call to reach Jerry Renault. Like everyone else, the goober had finally learned that Jerry was carrying out a vigil assignment. That's why he had refused to take the chocolates day after day. That's why he didn't want to talk about it with Goober. <clears throat> now Jerry could become himself again, human again. His football had suffered. What the hell is the matter with you, Renault? The coach asked in disgust yesterday. Do you want to play ball or not? And Jerry had answered, I'm playing ball. All the kids knew the double meaning his answer conveyed because it was public knowledge now. Okay, so let's talk about that a minute. He had said, I'm playing ball, which means he's going along with it. So the double meaning is he's playing ball in football. He's also going along with what the vigils have asked him to do. He is playing ball. He is agreeing to do what they asked. He and Goober had had one, only one brief conversation about the assignment. In fact, it wasn't really a conversation. Leaving football practice yesterday, Goober had whispered, when does the assignment end? And Jerry had said, tomorrow I take the chocolates. Hartnett, one. You can do better than that, Hartnett, Leon said. But there was no anger, not even disappointment in his voice. Brother Leon was buoyant today, and his mood had spread throughout the class. That's the way Leon's classes were. He set the mood and the temperature. When Brother Leon was happy, everybody was happy. When he was miserable, everybody was miserable. Okay, we got a vocab word. Which one is it? Uh, buoyant. Oh, buoyant. Okay, good one. So in the context, let me see if I can find it again. It said, um, Brother Leon was buoyant today. So what does buoyant mean? Buoyant usually, it, if you look at the word, you can see the word buoy in there. It means you're floating right? It's like you're buoyant in the water. It means you're floating in the water. So his mood today is he is elevated. He is feeling good. He is happy. He is floating. Kind of like on cloud nine, right? You hear that phrase, floating on cloud nine. This is Brother Leon. He is above the water and not feeling the pressure. Good one. Buoyant is a good one. Mm -hmm. All right. Johnson, five. Good, good. Kalea, LeBlanc, Malaron. The roll call went on, the voices shouting out their sales, and the teacher checking the names off on the, on the sheet. The names and the responses sounded almost like a song, a melody for a classroom, a tune for many voices. Then Brother Leon called out, Parmen Parmen cheer. And there was tension in the air. Parmen cheer could have called out any number and it wouldn't have mattered. It wouldn't have created in any impact at all because the next name was Renault. Three, Parmen cheer called out. Right, Brother Leon answered, making the check against the name. Looking up, he called Renault. The pause. The damn pause. Nope. The goober felt as if his eyes were the lens for a television camera in one of those documentaries. He swung around in Jerry's direction and saw his friend's face white, mouth half open, his arms drang dangling at his sides, and then he swiveled to look at Brother Leon and saw the shock on the teacher's face, his mouth forming an oval of astonishment. 
It seemed almost as if Jerry and the teacher were reflections in a mirror. Finally, Brother Leon looked down. Renault, he said again, his voice like a whip. No, I'm not going to sell the chocolates. Cities fell. Earth opened. Planets tilted. Stars plummeted. And the awful silence. All right, so this was one of our big questions. If we go back to our Cornell notes um, for today. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. Cornell notes for today, chapter 17, 18, and 19. Will Jerry start selling the chocolates? We just answered our question. No. Why did he say no? What do you think? Mm, well, I mean, the, the day is technically over to start saying no, unless he has one more day, but. I don't know. I guess maybe he doesn't want to get in the whole mix. Maybe. I mean, this this is hard to know. We're going to have to dig into Jerry's brain on this because the vigils are no longer pressuring him. Mm. Now it's something else. Something else. Right? Maybe now he just wants to do it for him. I don't know. Okay. So we know the answer to part of our essential question. Now let's go back to uh, chapter 18. Why did you do it? I don't know. Have you gone crazy? Maybe I have. It was a crazy thing to do. I know, I know. The way that no popped out of your mouth, why? I don't know. It was like the third degree. Only he was both interrogator and suspect, both tough cop and hounded prisoner, a cruel spotlight pinning him in a blinding circle of light. All of this in his mind, of course, as he tossed in his bed, the sheet twisted around him like a shroud, suffocatingly. He fought the sheet, filled suddenly with the terror of claustrophobia, being buried alive. Aware of his mortality, he turned over again, entangled in the bedclothes. His pillow fell off the bed, hitting the floor with a dull thud, like a small body landing there. He thought of his mother, dead in the coffin. When did death arrive? He had read a magazine article about heart transplants. Even the doctors couldn't agree on the exact moment that death occurred. Listen, he told himself. No one can be buried alive these days, not like in the olden days when there were no embalming fluid and stuff. Now they removed all your blood and pumped in chemicals to make certain you were dead. But suppose, let's just suppose that some small spark in your brain remained alive and knew what was going on. His mother, himself, someday. He leaped from the bed in terror, fleeing the sheet away. His body was moist, oozing perspiration. He sat on the edge of the bed, trembling. Then his feet touched the floor, and the cool kiss of the linoleum established reality. The specter of suffocation vanished. He made his way through the darkness to the window and pulled back the drape. The wind came up, scattering October leaves, which fluttered to the ground like doomed and crippled birds. Why did you do it? I don't know. Like a broken record. Was it because of what Brother Leon does to people like Bailey? The way he tortures them, tries to make fools of them in front of everybody? More than that, more than that. Then what? He allowed the drape to fall back into place and surveyed the bedroom, squinting into the half-darkness. He padded over to the bed, shivering in the kind of coolness that can only be found in the middle of the night. He listened for night sounds. His father snored in the next room. A car gunned along the street outside. He'd love to be gunning along the street, going someplace, anywhere. I'm not going to sell the chocolates. Boy. He hadn't planned to do any such thing, of course. He'd been happy to have the terrible assignment over with, the assignment completed and life normal once again. Every morning he dreaded the roll call, the necessity of facing Brother Leon saying no and watching Leon's reaction, how the teacher tried to pass off Jerry's rebellion as if it didn't matter, putting on a pathetic pretense of indifference, but a tr pretense that was so transparent, so phony. It had been funny and terrible at the same time, watching Leon call the roll and waiting for his name to be called, and finally his name blazing in the air and the defiant no. The teacher might have been able to carry off his act successfully, except for his eyes. His eyes gave him away. His face was always under control, but his eyes showed his vulnerability, gave Jerry a glimpse into the hell that was burning inside the teacher. Those moist eyes, the white eyeballs, and the diluted blue of his, his pupils, eyes that reflected everything that went on in the class, reacting to everything. 
After Jerry had learned that the secret of Brother Leon lurked in his eyes, he became watchful, seeing the way his eyes betrayed the teacher at every turn. And then there came a time when Jerry was tired of it all. Tired of watching the teacher, disgusted with the contest of wills that wasn't really a contest, because Jerry had no choice. Cruelty sickened Jerry, and the assignment, he realized after a few days, was cruel. Even though Archie Costello had insisted that it was only a stunt that everyone would get a kick out of later, and so he had finally waited, impatient for the assignment to come to an end, eager for that silent battle between Brother Leon and himself to be over with, he wanted life to be normal again. Football, even his homework, without that daily burden weighing him down. He had felt isolated from the other fellows, separated by the secret he was forced to carry. He'd been tempted, once or twice, to talk it over with the goober. In fact, he'd almost done so, once when goober tried to start a conversation. Instead, he'd cautioned himself to hold on for the two weeks, to carry it off, secrecy and all, and be done with it for good. He had met Brother Leon in the corridor late one afternoon after football practice and had seen hate flashing in the teacher's eyes. More than hate. Something sick. Jerry had felt soiled, dirty, as if he should run to confession and bare his soul. And he'd consoled himself. When I accept the chocolates and Brother Leon realizes I was only carrying out a vigil assignment, then everything will be fine again. Then why had he called no this morning? He'd wanted to end the ordeal, and then that terrible no had issued from his mouth. In bed once more, Jerry lay without moving, trying to summon sleep. Listening to his father's snores, he thought of how his father was acting, sleeping his life away, sleeping even when he was awake, not really alive. And how about me? What was it the guy on the common had said the other day, his chin resting on the Volkswagen like some grotesque John the Baptist? You're missing a lot of things in the world. He turned over dismissing his doubts and calling to mind the figure of a girl he'd seen downtown the other day. His sweater had bulged beautifully, her school books pressed against her rounded breasts. If my hands were only those books, he thought longingly. His hand now curled between his legs, he concentrated on the girl, but for once it was no good, no good. So even Jerry doesn't know why he's saying no. So that does not answer our question. We don't know. But there's definitely a power struggle going on here. And something that Ashley brought up earlier was um, about the title of the book, The Chocolate War. It has turned into a battle. And it's a battle of wills. And who are the wills at play here? The Vigils, Mm -hmm. Brother Leon, and now Jerry. So we don't know who's going to win this battle, but it could get uglier. Chapter 19. The next morning, Jerry found out how a hangover must feel. His eyes burned with fire, fueled by lack of sleep. His head throbbed with shooting pains. His stomach was sensitive to the slightest movement, and the lurching of the bus caused strange reactions in his body. It reminded him of when he was a kid and got car sick, sometimes on trips to the beach with his parents so that they'd have to stop the car by the side of the road while Jerry either vomited or waited for the storm in his stomach to subside. Do you get car sick? No. <laughs> What added to his troubles this morning was the possibility of a test in geography, and he hadn't studied at all last night. So wrapped up in what he'd done in the chocolate sale and what had happened in Leon's class, now he was paying the penalty for too little sleep and no study. Trying to read a lousy geography lesson on a lumbering, lurching bus, the morning light dazzling on the white page, someone, somebody slipped into the seat beside him. Hey, we're not. You got guts, know that? Jerry looked up blinded momentarily as his eyes shifted from the page to the face of the kid who'd spoken to him. He knew him vaguely from school, a junior maybe, lighting a cigarette the way all the smokers did despite the no smoking signs. The kid shook his head. Boy, you really let Leon that bastard have it. Beautiful. He blew out smoke. Jerry's eyes stung. Oh, he said, feeling stupid and surprised. Funny, all this time he had thought of the situation as a private battle between Brother Leon and himself, as if the two of them were alone on the planet. Now he realized that it had gone beyond that. I'm so sick of selling the frigging chocolates, the kid said. He had a terrible case of acne, his face like a relief map, and his fingers were stained with nicotine. I've been at Trinity two years. I transferred from Monument High when I was a freshman, 
and I'm tired of selling stuff. He tried to blow a smoke ring, but failed. Worse than that, the smoke blew back in Jerry's face, stinging his eyes. If it isn't chocolates, it's Christmas cards. If it isn't Christmas cards, it's soap. If it isn't soap, it's calendars. But you know what? What? Jerry asked, wanting to get back to his geography. I never thought of just saying no, like you did. I've got some studying to do, Jerry said, not knowing what to say, really. Boy, you're cool, know that? The kid said admiringly. Jerry blushed with pleasure despite himself. Who didn't want to be admired? And yet he felt guilty, knowing that he was accepting the kid's admiration under false pretenses. He wasn't cool at all. Not at all. His head pounded and his stomach moved menacingly, and he realized he had to face Brother Leon in the roll call again this morning. And all the mornings to come. Why'd that kid think he was cool? Because he stood up for himself. He stood up for himself. That's huge. In the face of no support and all odds, right? He's standing by himself and he's doing it. And maybe that's maybe that's why he did it. I mean, he doesn't even know. Maybe that's it. The goober was waiting for him at the school's entrance, standing tense and troubled among the other fellows waiting for school to start, like prisoners resigned to execution, taking their final drags from cigarettes before the bells began to ring. The goober motioned Jerry aside. Jerry followed him guiltily. He realized that goober wasn't the cheerful, happy-go-lucky kid he'd known when school first started. What had happened? He'd been so wrapped up in his own concerns that he hadn't bothered about goob. Jeez, Jerry, what did you do it for? Goober asked, drawing him away from the others. Do what? But he knew what Goober meant. The chocolates! I don't know, Goob, Jerry said. It was no use faking out Goober the way he had faked out that kid on the bus. That's the truth. I don't know. You're asking for trouble, Jerry. Brother Leon spells trouble. Look, Goob, Jerry said, wanting to reassure his friend, wanting to wipe that look of concern from his face. It's not the end of the world. 400 kids in the school are going to sell chocolates. What does it matter if I don't? It's not that simple, Jerry. Brother Leon won't let you get away with it. The warning bells sounded. Cigarettes were flipped into the gutter or mashed to the sand-filled receptacle near the door. Last drags were inhaled lingeringly. Guys who'd been sitting in cars listening to rock on the radio switched them off and slammed the doors behind them. Nice going, kid, somebody said, hurrying by. The pat on the ass Trinity's traditional gesture of friendship. Jerry didn't see who it was. Keep it up, Jerry. This, a corner-of-the-mouth whisper from Adamo, who hated Leon with a vengeance. See how the word is spreading? Goobert hissed. What's more important, football and your marks or the lousy chocolate sale? The bell rang again. It meant two minutes left to get to your locker and then to your homeroom. A senior by the name of Benson approached them. Seniors were trouble for freshmen. It was better to be ignored by them than to be noticed, but Denson was clearly headed in their direction. He was a nut known for his lack of inhibitions, his complete disregard of the rules. As he neared Jerry and Goober, he began a Jimmy Cagney imitation, shooting his cuffs and hunching his shoulders. Hey there, guy. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be in your shoes. I wouldn't be in your shoes for a thou, boy, a mill. He punched Jerry playfully on the arm. You couldn't fit those shoes anyway, Benson, somebody yelled, and Benson danced away. Sammy Davis now, wide grin, feet tappy, body whirling. Walking up the stairs, stairs, Goober said, Do me a fairy, favor, Jerry. Take the chocolates today. I can't, Goob. Why not? I just can't. I'm committed now. Oh, the goddamn vigils, Goober said. Jerry had never heard Goober swear before. He'd always been a mild kind of kid, rolling with the punches, loose and carefree, running around the track while the other kids sat up tight during practice sessions. It's not the vigils, Goob. They're not in it anymore. It's me. They stopped at Jerry's locker. All right, Goober said, resigned, knowing it was useless to pursue the subject any further at the moment. Jerry felt sad suddenly because Goober looked so troubled, like an old man heaped with all the so sorrows of the world, his thin face drawn and haggard, his eyes haunted, as if he had awakened from a nightmare he couldn't forget. Jerry opened his locker. He had thumbtacked a poster to the back wall of the locker on the first day of school. The poster showed a wide expanse of beach a sweep of sky with a lone star glittering far away. A man walked on the beach, a small solitary figure in all that immensity. At the bottom of the poster, these words appeared. 
do I dare disturb the universe by Eliot, who wrote the wasteland thing they were studying in English. Jerry wasn't sure of the poster's meaning, but it had moved him mysteriously. It was traditional at Trinity for everyone to decorate the interior of his locker with a poster. Jerry chose this one. He had no time to want to ponder the poster any longer. The final bell rang, and he had 30 seconds to get to class. Adamo, two. Bivo, three. It was a different roll call this morning, a new melody, a new tempo, as if Brother Leon were the conductor in the class, the members of a verbal orchestra, but something wrong with the beat, something wrong with the entire proceedings, as if, as if the members of the orchestra were controlling the pace and not the conductor. No sooner would Brother Leon call out a name than the response came immediately before Leon had time to, take, to make a notation in the ledger. It was the kind of spontaneous game that developed in classes without premeditation, everyone falling into a sudden conspiracy. The quickness of the responses kept Brother Leon busy at his desk, head bent, pencil furiously scribbling. Jerry was glad that he wouldn't have to look into those watery eyes. LeBlanc, one. Malaron, two. Names and numbers sizzled in the air, and Jerry began to notice something curious about it. All the ones and twos, and an occasional three. But no fives, no tens. And Brother Leon's head still bent, concentrating on the ledger. And finally, Renault! It would be so easy, really, to yell yes, to say, give me the chocolates to sell, Brother Leon. So easy to be like the others, not to have to confront those terrible eyes every morning. Brother Leon finally looked up. The temple of the roll call, roll call had broken. No, Jerry said. He was swept with sadness, a sadness deep and penetrating, leaving, leaving him desolate like someone washed up on a beach, a lone survivor in a world full of strangers. All right, two questions that I'm going to have Ashley add to the Cornell notes. One is, why is the goober so depressed? What's happened to him, right? Mm -hmm. Why do you think he's so down? And then now... I want you to consider, is Jerry doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. Okay, so give me your personal response to that. Is Jerry doing the right thing, and why do you think that or not? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, that is the end of this section, and um, Ashley will get those notes in there.